Good morning. morning. Hey, that was a lot better than 9 o'clock, but online campus, great to see you guys. I'm not going to let you experience anything different than we did at our 9 o'clock service. So just in case some of you are a little tired, a little cold, a little wet from the temperatures outside, let's stand up and stretch a little bit, can we? Everybody up. Stand up, stretch, Ah, hug your wife if she's next to you, whatever, you know, punch your husband, whatever you got to do, just to, you know, good. Ah. All right, grab a seat. Hey, online campus, you guys too, hug somebody around you, there we go. I am uh, really thrilled with what we're doing with our memory verse um, as part of our worship experience, and so... Every month, it's a new memory verse, and we're doing that all the way through 2022. And so last month was our first one. This month is Galatians 6, 9, and we're almost done with November, but it's Galatians 6, 9. Again, this is the tattoo uh, artwork that's there, and it's the first letter of every word in this scripture to help you memorize it a little bit better. There are coloring pages out on the table as you walked in, if, if that's your thing. But, but here's the scripture. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do you know it? Some of you do. I was impressed. We were doing a run through just sound checks this morning, and our booth text, they knew it. I'm going, way to go, guys. You know, that, that was impressive. Yeah, I know, Mike, you weren't there yet. But other than that, the other guys were good. So, hey, um, let's, so let's go through this. Are you ready? Don't look at that. Look at this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. I know some of you are in the middle of some pretty tragic moments. I know there are things happening to you and around you that you're going, I just want to give up. I know the holidays can bring on some of those emotions and feelings and deep sorrows. Do not give up. Don't do it. God is ready for you. He has prepared this life for you. He has so many great things in store for you. Do not give up. It's too important, guys. Your life is too valuable. It's too important to go, I'm done, I'm out, I just give up. Don't do it. Do not give up. Well, today is wrapping up our gratitude series, and, uh, and it kind of makes sense since this is Thanksgiving week, right? Anybody else love Thanksgiving? Yeah, some of you. How many of you have completely bypassed Thanksgiving and you've already decorated for Christmas? Stop it, would you please? Just slow down. We need to take this time just to give thanks, all right? To give thanks for everything that we have. To give thanks for every blessing that we've been given. And we need to take time for the food. Come on, people. We've got to take time for this. What's your favorite Thanksgiving food? Somebody tell me. Sweet potato casserole, dressing, pumpkin pie, stuffing. stuffing. Uh, Okay, just let me tell you this in case you don't know. Stuffing and dressing are the same thing, all right? (laughs) Mashed potatoes, potato casserole. Um, Somebody said um, cranberry relish earlier. (laughs) Cranberry salad, there's a good one. Anything cranberry, I'm out. I'm just telling you. But other than that, my favorite, pumpkin spice coffee. Uh, I'm just telling you, that's my favorite Thanksgiving food right there. Now, gratitude is such... Anybody hungry now? I mean, you're going, we're talking food. We've been loading turkeys into the trailer out there. We're, We're just hungry. Gratitude is such a huge part of Thanksgiving. As a matter of fact... It should all be about gratefulness, thankfulness. Give me one thing you're thankful for. Family, a good job, job. friends, health, a roof over your head, all those things. Your church, thank you. Health, what'd you say? 
I thought you said gas. I'm going, well, I, I don't know what that means. Okay. Cats and dogs, we'll take that. <laughs> I'm stopping right there. My mind is already gone. All right. You know, we, we put out these gratitude prompts as a church for every day of the last two weeks to help you start thinking daily about gratitude. And one of them this week was this, what's the favorite thing about your best friend? And there were some really interesting comments out there because friendship is huge, for something huge to be grateful for. One person put, my favorite thing about my best friend is no matter what time of day or situation, if I need her, she's there in an instant. Sometimes I don't even realize I need her and she's still there. She makes me laugh. We always have a great time together and she's the best little sister ever. That, that's a great statement. You know, it shows the importance of a best friend. Somebody else put this, my, what I'm grateful for about my best friend is that he married me. <laughs> Hallmark, sappy movies, quote, I don't know, I'm just kidding. That's a great quote. Let's move on to the next one. Who is someone who has changed your life? And someone put this, my sister from another mister, Jenna. She told me if I ever got the chance to go on a mission trip to Northern Ireland, it would really change my life. I ended up doing missions work there for three years after college, and because of her, I met my now husband. That's pretty cool. You know, somebody has changed your life. Somebody put this, my husband, he's so good to me, and he takes great care of me. Guys, <laughs> ladies, quit making the rest of the guys look bad. Would you please? I mean, it's just... It's just <laughs> I hope that over the last few weeks, you've allowed these thoughts on gratitude to really impact you. I hope that you've been practicing gratitude and, and you're starting to see a shift in your thinking from being ungrateful to being grateful. If you missed a week, go back on YouTube, Facebook, website, and, and, and catch up on these teachings because they're really, really good. The first week, we talked about what gratitude is, and this is our definition. Gratitude is the quality of being thankful, a readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. Gratitude is an action. It's not something you sit back and take passively. It's an action word. It's more than just saying, oh, thank you for doing that and letting it be just kind of pass everybody by. It's life-changing. It's something you have to be involved with. We talked about how gratitude changes us as individuals and how the Holy Spirit uses gratitude to grow the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, to grow things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. We, we, we talked about how living out gratitude every day creates these neural pathways in our brains. And the more you live out gratitude, the more those neural pathways become gratitude highways. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and just uh, allows all these offshoots, these off-ramps in that highway to allow us to experience love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control in different ways for different people around us. That's how it works. But it's so easy for us to focus on the negatives. It's so easy for us to have that Velcro thing in our brain that no matter what anybody says to you, you hold on to the one negative. And you're still holding on to the one negative. And that just sneaks in to our lives and it leaves us dissatisfied and it leaves us bitter and it destroys our relationships. That's how one bad thing in your life can change who you are, no matter what a thousand good things may happen to you. We threw out the challenge to thank someone with a thoughtful thank you. How did that go for you this last week? Not just a thank you and move on, thank you, thank you, thank you, but a thoughtful, meaningful thank you. I mean, thoughts that, 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 that just show someone, a thank you that shows someone that you see their efforts, you see the impact they're making, you see the sacrifice that they're giving, and it's not about you, it's about them and your thankfulness in that way. We looked at how difficult it is to receive things from other people. That's the number one comment I got this last week is, I just struggle with receiving anything because it makes me feel like I'm indebted to someone or it makes me feel weak 
Friends, you cannot give without learning how to receive, and you can't receive without learning how to give. You've got to accomplish both of those. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. We receive and then we give, and we receive and then we give, and then we give and then we receive. That's how it works. It's this cycle of giving. Now, today we're going to camp out on doing gratitude together by giving thanks. That's what you expect at Thanksgiving, right? Oh, we're talking about being thankful. Let's go a different direction. Let's look at how Jesus expressed gratitude and how Jesus gave thanks today and see what we can learn from that. If you have your Bibles, your iPads, your version apps, open to John chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 1. John 6, 1. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. As a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill, sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy food or bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that to this huge crowd? Five loaves, two fish. Remember those numbers. They're important for this story, all right? Let's keep going. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Understand this, 5,000 men, probably 5,000 women, probably 10,000 kids. You're talking 15 to 20,000 people. That is a massive crowd, massive, even in today's terms. That's a massive crowd. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, distributed them to the people And afterwards, he did the same with the fish, all right? After they all ate as much as they wanted, 15 or 20,000 people ate all that they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, no, go gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the barley loaves, 12 baskets. Another important number to remember, five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is a prophet that we've been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away through the hills by himself. Now, if you grew up in church, if you grew up at vacation Bible school, if you grew up going to church camp, I know you've heard this story. Because it's one of Jesus' most famous miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. But I want to unpack this a little bit. Because there's so much more to it than just reading the story and seeing what obviously happened. There's a lot of things in there that I bet you've never seen before. Now, this miracle happens on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, which is mostly a Jewish area. So Jesus is teaching... And he sees who's there. It was the Jews, right? He he knew who's there. He knew his crowd. And so he's playing to exactly who his crowd is. He focused his teaching to speak directly to them. One of the most important people for the ancient Jews was the prophet called Moses. All right? The hero that God used to bring the Israelite people out of slavery, out of captivity, out of Egypt, and he led them to the promised land. So obviously Moses is a big-time character for the ancient Jews, and even today, obviously. Now Passover was getting close, and Passover is the celebration of God's kind of stepping in and freeing the Israelite people from slavery. And he knew that all the people that were there listening to him would be getting together and sitting around tables with friends and family for the Passover. They'd be eating special food. They'd be celebrating all the good things that God had done for them. They'd sing and pray and tell stories and give thanks. 
Sound like a holiday that we have coming up soon? Yeah, very similar. Jesus knew that. So he sets this miracle up in a way that just hit these Jewish people right smack in the face. He uses the whole Passover scenario. And he pointed out that the people were hungry. They couldn't feed themselves. He looked at what they had and said they saw five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, whenever you see numbers in the Bible, here's something to think about. As you read through the scripture, you see numbers. You need to take a step back and look a little more closely at that because it's usually a story within a story. There's something bigger happening there that you're not picking up. And it points it out if you simply take the time to read it. Scholars believe the number five represented the Torah. That's the first five books of the Old Testament. It was the law. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books. It's the law. Moses gave that. And then they think the number two represents the two stone tablets that were carried by Moses. Ten Commandments, stone tablets, five and two. Then Jesus sat them down. And Luke recorded this. He said that Jesus sat them down in groups of about 50 people. Now, it was probably a semicircle where they could still see Jesus teach, but, but they're sitting there in these, these groups of 50, and it was similar the way that he set it up to the way that the Israelites, when they left Egypt, would have set up their camps in these groups all around so they could still see and connect to each other. You see some of the similarities here to Moses' story. Hungry group of people, they can't feed themselves, they have this incredible prophet-like figure, Jesus is reenacting their history. He's reenacting what happened to them. And then Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks for it. And understand this, the ancient Jews considered bread to be a gift from God. Read through the Old Testament, you're going to see some of the prophets that God provides bread for. Now, now it's, it's incredibly important teachings, like Elijah. He's depressed after killing all the prophets of Baal. He's sitting under a tree, and God provides these loaves of bread for him to be able to sustain him. And then there's a widow that has nothing, only a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and God continues to replenish that so there can be bread for her family to be able to survive. And then God gave the Israelites, as they're wandering around in the wilderness, this, this bread called manna. And every day, because they were complaining, complaining, not enough food, no bread, we're tired of what we have, God provided this manna. Every single day they could go out and gather it up, but they couldn't keep it, they couldn't can it, they couldn't pack it, because it was spoiled after that day. It was only enough for that day. Just enough so they trusted in God for that day. God, thank you for providing this for today. Nothing extra, just enough for that day. One traditional Jewish blessing says this, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Bread was a gift. And here's Jesus. He's lifting that bread up, giving thanks, breaking it and passing it to the people and breaking it and passing it to the people and breaking it and passing it to the people over and over and over until 15 or 20,000 people had eaten all that they wanted and they were full. It's just like the manna in the wilderness. Only this time there are leftovers. How many baskets of leftovers? Twelve. You understand what that represents? It represents the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. Which represents in the wholeness all of the people of Israel. None of these people, none of these Jews would have missed what Jesus was saying here. They would see that and say, ah, This guy's a prophet, just like Moses was. Maybe even a little bit greater. This could be the Messiah. But they wanted to make him an earthly king and not a spiritual king, so he slipped away. He was trying to show them that God was doing something new, something better for their lives. But they couldn't get that. I mean, they only got part of it. They got the food part, and that was a pretty cool miracle. But they missed the biggest part of that. The next day, Jesus tried to explain it to them again, but they still didn't get it. They wanted the miracles, they wanted the gift kind of stuff, but they didn't want to receive all of the truth that was there, just what physically met their needs. John 6, 32, 
Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. It wasn't about Moses, it was about God. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And they still didn't get it. It just went right over their heads. And it's kind of easy for us to look back 2,000 years ago and go, why didn't they get that? Do you get that? Most of us don't. We get the miracle but we miss the point of the miracle. We settle for part of what God wants for us and not everything. I want to circle back to verse 11 here just for a minute. I want to point out an important word. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Give thanks. Give thanks. You know, our English language is really limited in the meanings that we have. We're actually kind of backwards on a lot of things that we say and, and, and how we say them. We don't really get the full picture uh, in the English language. We say, give thanks, and we just mean, oh, thank you, God, and we move on from that. In the Greek, the word here is eucharistis, and it originated from the Greek word eucharistio, meaning to be thankful. Break that word down a little bit, okay? This is your Greek lesson for the day. Break that word down a little bit. You means good. Charis means grace or kindness. And it literally means to be thankful to God for His good grace and His good kindness. One word says all of that. So Jesus took the loaves and He thanked God for His goodness and grace and kindness more than just give thanks. He thanked God for that, and this is important because a few days later, he does the same thing again in a different scenario. He used that same word. Jesus is celebrating the Passover because Jesus was from Jewish descent, and he's, pa- he's celebrating this Passover meal with his disciples, and they gathered around the table, and their minds had to, all the disciples, their minds had to be full of everything they had learned and seen over the past couple of days. And the tradition was this, that the head of the Jewish household would hold up the bread and they would say this, this is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate when they came from Egypt. It's remembering where they had come from, remembering what God had done for them, celebrating that, that, that they're set free. And Jesus surprised everyone. Instead of saying that, he said this, Luke twenty two nineteen. He took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Passover has always been about remembering. Remembering what God has done. Remembering what what Jesus now has done in, in our current culture where he took it further and he said, not only remember the Passover, but now I am the bread of life. I am the gift. So breaking and passing the bread again and again and again, the disciples still didn't get it. They didn't get the fact that Jesus was, was their bread of life. They just didn't get it. They only got part of it. They couldn't accept all of it until he was killed, buried, resurrected. Then they got it. Then they figured out what Jesus was actually talking about. And don't miss this. Jesus has never stopped offering that gift of freedom. Never. To the people in that culture and the people in our culture. He's never stopped offering this gift of eat your fill. And then these baskets of leftovers, they're not just for you. It's a gratitude thing. There's another word we get from Eucharistio, which is the Eucharist, and it's not a word that we use in this church very often, but it's the the, the same word that we translate into communion here at Community Church, which is something that we celebrate every single week. We drink juice and we eat bread to help us remember, to remember the meal that Jesus took with his disciples, to remember the Passover 
for the Jews and the meal of what Jesus was going to be and what he was trying to teach them. And we use the time to reflect and connect on the Eucharistius, to thank God for his grace and kindness. One of the things that Jesus and the disciples would have done during that meal would have been to read Psalm 113 as they did the communion or the Eucharist. Now Shelley is going to read Psalm 113 for us and the band's going to lead us in singing a song based on that verse. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your communion out. It's in the seat racks in front of you if you don't have it. When Shelley's done reading Psalm 113 and the band starts playing this beautiful song, I want you to remember what Jesus has done, that Jesus is the bread of life, that Jesus sacrificed his body and his blood for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets the name of the Lord is to be praised the Lord is exalted over all the nations his glory above the heavens who is like the Lord our God the one who sits enthroned on high who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth he raises the poor from the dust he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord.
My prayer for you is that you continue to practice gratitude every single day. That you allow it to change yourself and change your relationships. I pray that you get to celebrate Thanksgiving with people that you love. That you gather around a table and you thank God for his goodness. You thank God for his kindness. And you step out and lead that prayer if no one else will in your family. It's too important to miss. And then I hope you go and pay it forward do that today you can deliver turkeys you can do it this week by raking somebody's yard or baking somebody cookies or making somebody a pecan pie guys let God's greatness and his goodness show through you because he loves you more than you ever realize God bless you